Hey folks, this is Brian. This is uh, my uh, session review for session three of my uh, Crocus Kareen campaign, chapter one, A Baboon Hunt. Uh, so last time we left off, <coughs> excuse me, our, uh, our heroes in, uh, in the cavern. They had just finished dispatching the uh, rock lizards. <coughs> And as uh, I believe I discussed at the end of the last video, um, while the rock lizards were none of them were killed outright, but due to uh, limb damage and and uh, shock and that kind of thing, they were all incapacitated. Uh, so the party decided to you know attempt to do peaceful cut and uh, dispatch all of the uh, rock lizards in an honorable fashion. Uh, since there wasn't any stress or time requirements, you know, let them have all kinds of modifiers, and so it wasn't really an issue uh, to do that here. Um, also, the um, the uh, sorcerer, who has a brother who's a leather worker, was thinking, hey, these the hides on these critters were pretty tough. We might be able to make some decent leather armor out of these things if we've got enough hide available. Uh, so they decided that at some point they're going to go ahead and and uh, skin skin the rock lizards and take them out. Uh, but after they they dispatch the, uh, the the rock lizards, they're trying to figure out okay now where did things go? What's happening? Um, where are we now? Kind of thing. So they do some searching around, um, and uh, a couple of the players or characters hear noises back around the corner. Where the rock lizards came from, you know, some squawking kind of thing. I had to make some rolls and they were able to put two and two together and realize that it sounds like baby rock lizards. <laughs> There's probably a nest back there or something. Uh, but they aren't too worried about that. So they continue to search around um, for where's this cavern go. Um, they made uh, a search roll and I believe one of them got a critical. They're able to tell that uh, the baboons, or somebody, <laughs> had piled up rocks at a portion of this cavern and using uh, mud and rocks and uh, some kind of uh, lattice work had put up some kind of a block um, at this part of the tunnel to camouflage it. So it looked like it was just part of the cavern wall. So go up and they test it. You know they can't. It doesn't really push forward, but you know they can. There's parts where you can grab onto it and stuff and, and pull, and it does move. So two of them get up there and they kind of pull it out of the way. It's, you know maybe six feet wide, uh, fairly tall, but not unmanageable. But they pull it out of the way. Um, and they can see over this ledge because uh, there was a rock buildup at the, at the floor level. On the other side, the uh, the cavern floor goes up fairly steep you know climbable not not like rock climbable but, but you know climbable you know steep slope kind of thing and up the top are four baboons and they launch sling missiles down at them <laughs> so i make some rolls a couple of them actually got criticals but since they're using slings it's blunt damage and they don't have any damage bonus you know that kind of stuff happens so, but that was able to uh, put one guy's arm down and uh, damage uh, another one fairly well. Um, and one of the players uh, made a decent scan roll and was able to see that back behind these four baboons was another baboon uh, with a rock lizard. And um, it was a shaman who made that roll. So I had the shaman make uh, an intelligence roll kind of thing. Uh, to determine that, fa in fact, this baboon behind all the other baboons has the markings and the apparatus, the paraphernalia of possibly being a shaman. So they figure, okay, we're in overheads at this point. And they, they put the the uh, the wall back up out of the way. And um, then they, they back up through the cavern to a, a choke point to set the defense on the other side of it. So if the baboons come down after them, the baboons will be in the choke point and they'll be able to defend themselves. And they wait for about a minute or so, and the baboons are not following up on them. So, um, at this point, they fear the baboons aren't chasing after them. 
And um, Colin, the one with the uh, path watch spell up, since he now has visibility on the path, at least up to the top of the, that ridge line on the other side of the doorway, um, he's able to tell that the baboons are not there. Um, so they do investigate the... No, they don't. Not yet. Since there weren't any baboons there, they went, ahead, went further up, pulled the lattice work uh, wall back down, um, and, and, and climbed on up. Well, at the top of this ridge line, it, it dips down the other side, and there's a... Um, uh, the cavern goes east and west. East uphill, west downhill. Or right uphill, left downhill. Um, and so they're thinking that there's a back door to this place, and that's the way the baboons went in going uphill would make sense to do that. So they jump down and start following along. I mean, it's fairly narrow. You know, it's not confining, um, but it's yeah. not wide either, right? So if they're getting a fight in here, there'd be some issues. Uh, but they follow this pathway up, and sure enough, it gets to a point where there's like a, uh, a volcano blowhole or a vent where it just goes <laughs> practically straight up. Uh, and, and there's sunlight actually coming through, so they know it goes to the surface. They make some rolls, and they're able to determine, yeah, somebody or something has gone up and down through this way, but they couldn't tell if it was really baboons or not. So they turn around, and they go back to the other end of the cavern, and they come into this, you know, after the ledge piece, there's that kind of T intersection kind of piece, um, it opens up into a very large cavern, and there's there's campfire residue there, signs of a camp, that kind of thing. Um, so obviously the baboons have been camping out here for a while. They continue on back around and the cavern splits into two two uh, pathways. One dead end's fairly short and there's um, some obvious nesting area there. And the left hand side opens up to a wider area but does eventually just cut off. And there's a, a number of nesting areas there, you know, maybe a dozen. So they start thinking, okay, we got baboon shaman. You've got, you know, four or five baboons uh, plus young. Oh, that makes sense. Kind of a, a family uh, setup here. And that would account for pretty much everybody. So um, they head back over to the uh, last work entrance to the cavern or this section of the cavern. And get back down to the rock lizards and uh, they uh, decide to drag the bodies of uh, seven adult rock lizards out um, and they float them through the pool as they go across on the on the, the ledge a couple of had to take it take their time to get across but they all got through without any incident they get the bodies out into the, the sunlight where they can actually do some skinning and and I gather the the, the hides and then they uh, make a little travoy and uh, start dragging it back to uh, the Sundown Temple. Well, they get to uh, the Trade Time Festival area and they go to Lars's brother. He has a little stall where he does his leatherworking stuff. <laughs> Drop off the hides there um, and say, hey, we found these hides. We think we can make some armor out of this maybe and, you know, you can keep you know, some of it for yourself as payment for doing the thing. Well, yeah, we can make some some okay armor out of this. That'd be cool. Yeah, nice look. You know that, you know, alligator skin kind of boots kind of deal. So um, after that, they head to the temple to uh, try and find the Rand to tell him what they found out with the whole baboons and what they found out there and everything else. Well, on the way to the temple, uh, Pavrol, the um, Templar go-between that's been assigned to them comes running out and says, she's missing, she's missing, we can't find her. It's so like, you know, calm him down. It turns out that there is a, um, Yaloria, Yalorna, Yalorna archer, they're called something, uh, Kushile, Kushile archers. These are horse archers, uh, not really a subcult, but a uh, subspecialty of Yalorna's, um, cult. She is the sister of Yamalio. Uh, so there's this troop of these horse archers. They're all females. And uh, one of them, her name is Jarasa? Jarasa. Jarasa. And um, 
she was involved. Well, actually, all of them were involved in the horse race. There was a horse race earlier today, and as part of the Trade Time Festival, there's like a fairgrounds area where they do events each day towards the end of the festival. And the first one is horse racing. And so there was a horse race that day, and uh, they were all in love it. And Peverell's kind of got a thing for Jarasa, and uh, so he was watching. So he saw her in the horse race, but hasn't seen her since it ended. He, he saw her come across the finish line, so she, you know, congratulating that kind of thing. But she went off to take care of <clears throat> her horse and stuff. And um, she hasn't come back to the temple. And so he's, he's starting to freak out. So the party, um, party asks, you know, tries to get information out of him of what he knows. Uh, and then asks if there are any other of uh, these archers around. And uh, there are two that are in the barracks. So they go and see them um, and discuss with them about, you know, what they may have seen or may not have seen or what they think. Because they're not really that worried um, at this point. So, um the party goes to uh, check out uh, the the race area, right? There's this big circuit thing. It's a couple miles wide, a big circle loop kind of thing. And there are, are um, uh, bleachers set up, um, not only for the horse race, the start and finish, but there's you know, going to be jousting the next day and some other things will happen. So there's kind of a, a fairgrounds area here. They go and, and uh, start looking around. There is a corral there for the horses for before and after the races. <clears throat> and uh, there are a handful of horses in the corral. And uh, Arval thinks that that one is her horse, uh, but he's not sure. Um, and, and they look around. There's no tack or saddle on the horse itself. And there's a series of, of tents for people to, to set up and, and, and get ready and, and that kind of thing there. So they um, decided they want to go and track through the race to see if they can see anything untoward. Um, and they do that. They don't find anything. They get the other archers to come out. They actually identify, yeah, that is her horse. So they start searching the tents. They find a tent with, with her stuff. And um, they, you know, they're looking for some kind of a struggle or something here, and it's not. There are no signs of struggle whatsoever. It's very pristine. Our, our saddle's set up in one area. got tack hanging from, from hooks and stuff like that. So they do a little search through, and um, one of them, I believe it was a shaman. I think he's got really high perception skills. He's put a bunch into his perception skills. Uh, finds a note, and it's addressed, it's addressed to Loran specifically. It says... You have a prisoner we want to do an exchange. Leave your reply at the um, entry gate to the Trade Time Festival. At the Trade Time Festival on is the south end, maybe it's the west end. There's actually a big kind of gate thing that's been set up. So people who are leaving from the uh, tent seat coming around the actual market area coming through the through the entrance there and so kind of focus point funnel that kind of thing uh when the two archers they go we got to tell Loran about this now and so they all go and find Loran in the temple hand him the note and then uh he says uh, i'm gonna talk to the high priest about this and so that goes on the um Party's trying to figure out, how can we find out what happened to her? Um, specifically, the sorcerer's trying to figure out, is there a magical way, similar to the divination they did with the murder? <clears throat> Excuse me, since the murder occurred within a, a greater market, which is essentially a sacred place to Asaris, or Isaris, rather, um, there were some special circumstances for that, right? So, we went through a uh, rigmarole, but you know, a whole d discussion piece on okay, I belong to Lanker Mile. Our Lanker is associated with, um, or no, oh, yeah, Lanker Mile associated with Shalana Roy. Shalana Roy's got friendly with uh, Yalorna. You know, is there some kind of godly connection that way? 
not that cut and dry. God knows their peace. <laughs> gods know other gods, yeah, but they don't know other gods' pieces. So after a little discussion, I, your focus on your divination is fairly narrow. <laughs> There's like three things in uh, the divination description, not the spell itself, but description of divination that describes, you know, God knows what it knows. It knows what its rune uh, followers, and to a lesser extent, its initiates know because they pray. <laughs> so that's how they know those things. Um, and uh, their realm. For example, Orantha knows about things in the air. Uh, and that gives a little description about how, yeah, Orlanth may be able to tell you that there is a, an army marching towards you, but can't tell you how big the army is, who the army is, you know, that kind of stuff, right? So they're not going to be able to use divination to find out what happened to um, Jurasa, um, except that they make connection with the other archers, and the other archers are initiates of uh, Yorat, Yelorna. And so they've got common magic, divination is a common magic, and so they're able, they each take a turn. There is a shrine to Yelorna in the uh, Sun Dome Temple, and so they go there, it's a sacred spot, so they can cast divination there, and they attempt to do so. But uh, all five of them try throughout the night. There's the two happening right now, and later on, the other three will try. But uh, each one of them get a complete blank, nothing, no answer, nothing whatsoever, nobody's home, kind of thing. So that's kind of odd. And that, that puts um, some pressure on the people, well, on, on the party, on you know, how do we find out what happened to her, and that kind of thing. Um, so <clears throat> the uh, word from the temple the Sundone Temple, um, what they're going to do about this prisoner exchange is that they're going to go through with it. And the party wants to try to talk with uh, the wind lord or the actual murderer. His name was Dawur. On, um, you know, because they kind of piece together. This note may not have been written by people associated with Dawur wanting to get him back. Maybe people associated with the Glover trying to get the murderer, you know, that kind of thing. And so there's this dichotomy there on, is this a good thing for Dawur or a bad thing for Dawur? Um, and so they want to talk with him, let him, you know, lay it out for him. Hey, these guys could kill you if they get a hold of you kind of thing. Um, and so they ask for permission to speak with the uh, the Wind Lord uh, and, or the, uh, and or Dawur. And uh, so Loran goes to breach this, you know, question, will the Wind Lord or talk with them? And the Wind Lord will come and talk with them, but uh, just him. So uh, they go to the, the Great Hall in the corner there, and eventually the Wind Lord will show up. And uh, His view on the thing is while uh, Dawur, uh, as a trickster, invoked the protection of Orlanth, as if it were I, I think his actual verbiage uh, in that situation, being one of the light bringers and some kind of deal, uh, that he is protecting him from repercussions here and now for the murder. But hey, if the folks who want him are going to kill him, you know, that's just justice. That That's the Wind Lord's view on this whole thing. The party was kind of off on that because they kind of figured, you know, law and order, protect the people, you know, that kind of thing maybe, but it's not that deep of the situation here. Um, and then talking with the Wind Lord, uh, Dawur knows about the prisoner exchange and he does not seem to have any issues with it. Um, so everybody's kind of, well, okay, uh, is there anything that the temple or the Wind Lord or Rand needs for the party to do? <laughs> are, are, are we done? You know, that kind of thing. Um, and the Rand um, uh, says that he, well, he asked the party that if they would keep an eye on the note um, so they could maybe see who takes it and maybe follow who takes the note um, to give them some kind of an edge on the prisoner exchange, that would be helpful. Because uh, obviously they know who Lorand is. They called him by name. And they would recognize any of the Templars out there. So he can't have any of his men watching either. So he goes out and he pins the note up you know, fairly high on the post. And it's at an angle, so inside 
the the market area you know it's visible from a number of areas and there's a number of stalls there there's you know food places and and the sun shades and you know that kind of thing here um for lots of people milling about this is the entrance way right so there's still lots of traffic going on so the party divides themselves up into three um watches uh to watch the thing and uh the note gets taken down on the third watch but uh player the player character <laughs> It was Ferran, the, far, the Orlanti farmer. Uh, during his watch, the Nogus came down, but he was not able to see who, who took it. <laughs> uh, at that point, we were hitting 11 p.m. my time, and so uh, it seemed like a good spot, a stopping point to me. Uh, I provide, offered that up to the party. said, yeah, that's a good spot. We'll stop here. Uh, so there we go. Session three of um, A Baboon Hunt. Chapter, or session three of a baboon chapter one session three of chapter one of baboon hunt in the chronicles of harim happy gaming